I may present to him our Nobel Prize, the Comis <laughs> Medallion. All due to commiserate. Will you stand? Henry, may you wear this with pride tonight and then take it home with you and exhibit it in this beautiful frame for the future. We turn to you now and eagerly await your response. Thanks so very, very much for this. Enormous honor. I didn't realize when I was coming here tonight <laughs> that all this was going to happen and meet so many good friends and, and discover so many familiar faces and to reconnect with so many people has been part of my life. So I've been really, really grateful for this beautiful honor and for this, this wonderful evening that I can be here. And I've been just wondering what to say to you. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say when you have this opportunity? And, and I, I thought I, I just reflect a little bit about a few moments of my life that, that uh, have a very special meaning to me and maybe help you see something about my own development in, when I think about care and, 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 and uh, ministry. When I was at the university, um, at Yale Divinity School, in fact, there was an enormous restlessness in me. Because somewhere career-wise I was doing fine, but I was just wondering, you know, how to to live out my vocation in a, in a deeper, deeper way. And I, I was somewhere starting to discover that my career was getting in the way of my vocation. And, um, <laughs> and I, I, I just was struggling where to go. And first I thought I go to Latin America, and I did for a while. And, somewhere it didn't connect in, for the long term. And then I met a man um, many of you have heard of probably. He's called Jean Vanier. Jean Vanier is the um, son of the former Governor General of Canada who is the founder of L'Arche. And L'Arche is a, is a network of communities where people with mental handicaps and their assistants sort of create home for one another. And, and Jean is a very tall guy with a big nose and very, very tall and sort of bent over. And uh, he, uh, he invited me to just be with him. And uh, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? He said, I don't want you to talk about it all. He said, I I want you to be just silent with me for a few days. <laughs> so I said, okay. And when we were together, at a quiet moment, he said, Henry, maybe our people 
can offer you a home. And somewhere that really, really touched me in a way that I hadn't been touched before. Here was somebody who didn't say, we have a job for you, or you could help us, or there's a vacancy, or we need a pastor, or it would be wonderful if you could help our people, and we have so many needs. He's, none of that. He said, maybe our people can offer you a home. And that little invitation um, made me decide to leave the university and to, to go to France for a year and to discover L'Arche, this community where the mental handicapped people are in the center. And something happened there to me that, that really affected me very deeply. I, I suddenly realized that here were people who had never read any of my books, who couldn't care less whether I write or not. Here were people who didn't know anything about universities. Here were people who didn't even know that I, you know, had done this or that or been here or there. But somewhere they communicated to me God's first love. And I, that word of John, you know, you only can love one another because God has loved you first. His first love that had nothing to do with what you do or what you accomplish or with your career or with your writing or that first love was communicated to me very intimately by people who could hardly speak, who could often not walk and were very, very weak. And suddenly it hit me in a whole new way that the first of the Beatitudes is blessed are the poor and not blessed are those who care for the poor. And, and it started to really, really touch me that there was a blessing coming from those who are poor in spirit to me, a real blessing. And I had to learn to receive that blessing. And in a way, it were the people who in the society were considered to be quite marginal and maybe useless who who were carrying a blessing for me, which I needed badly to receive. And who, in a way, brought me in touch with my own poverty, where there is also a blessing for others. But somehow, I started to discover that the blessing that we have to offer to each other is hidden in our poverty in these places in our life where we are quite weak and quite vulnerable, quite broken. And it is that experience that brought me to the decision to, to dedicate my life to people with mental handicaps, not just to serve them, but as well to receive their blessing. And so I went to Toronto um, and became a member of the Daybreak community there. And there I met another person who I want to talk to you about a little bit. And some of you in know that person, uh, Lee Udell, who is here with us tonight. We are friends, came to visit me there just after I uh, arrived there. And when I came to Daybreak, they, uh, they asked me to care for a man whose name was Adam. So here I was, asking, being asked to care for Adam. And Adam was a man of 24 years old who couldn't speak, who could hardly walk, who had constantly grand mal seizures, who had a curved back, who couldn't really recognize me. He was a very, very weak person. And here I am, you know, coming out of the university world. And could, could you give a bath to Adam? Could you get Adam up this morning? And I tell you, I was scared. I mean, 
early in the morning I had to get up and get Adam out of bed and take off his clothes, bring him to the bathtub, give him a bath, uh, brush his teeth, shave him, uh, decide what, to dra what he should wear today, and look outside if it's but cold or warm or whatever, and go back and help him with his breakfast, and, 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 and then, you know, bring him to the place where he would spend the rest of the day. And I tell you, something happened there to me, that Adam and I gradually, very gradually, uh, became people very connected to one another in a place that I, uh, I didn't realize existed, actually. In the beginning, I was just afraid of him, and how do I do this, and how do I help this person? And gradually, I realized that for the rest of the day, I was thinking about Adam, I was thinking about this two and a half hours in the morning that I spent with him. And I, I started to realize that I loved Adam. And that somewhere, Adam had become my teacher. Adam had become my new university professor. Telling me things I already knew, but, but didn't really claim fully. And as I developed that relationship with this very, very handicapped person. You know, he taught me that being is more important than doing, and I'm a doer. I want to do things, I do a lot. And he told, taught me in a whole new way that the heart is more important than the mind. And here you come out of a university world where the mind is so celebrated. And Somewhere I realized that what, what makes a human person human is that incredible capacity to give and receive love. That that's, that's at the center of our humanity. And Adam was, was teaching me that truth just by being Adam, by being there for me. And Adam was making me aware of something that that I'd forgotten that it is better to be together than to be alone. Adam couldn't live for a day without about 10 or 15 people caring for him. I only spent a few hours with him, but then somebody else, and then somebody else, and then somebody else. And in the daybreak community, people came from South Africa, and South America, and from Japan, and from Australia, and from Holland, and Germany, and the United States. To, to be assistants. And we wouldn't be able to get along very well with one another if it wasn't for Adam. Suddenly I realized that Adam was saying, for me to live, you have to love one another. And in a way, Adam was the, the, the most precious part of the body that needed a lot of protection, but also that created the body. This very handicapped person became the source of, of life for hundreds of people, and for me, first of all. And he, he taught me something that, that I hadn't been able to, to learn at the university. And finally, I, I just want to say something about my own present struggles, just to share that with you. I've now been at Daybreak um, a large for eight years, and uh, it's not easy, you know, to live in a small community. Uh, partially it's not easy because those who have handicaps make you aware of your own handicaps. And uh, it's nice, in the university you can go to your apartment and then be yourself, but, uh, but here you're always there. And, and, and they know you quite well. I always take, mostly, not now, because I am on my way to a community in, in, in Mobile, but mo mostly I, I take one of the members of my community with me to, 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 uh, on my trips, and uh, I tell you, they keep you humble. <laughs> Simple. Uh, my good friend Bill van Buren, who always travels with me uh, when I go far, uh, you 
know, when I give this big talk and I really want to impress my audience, I remember, I really wanted to make a point that everybody would really, really listen. So he was standing beside me and I was giving this speech and I was working up to the point and finally I said it and it was absolute silence. And he suddenly he burst it out and said, well, he said, I've heard this before. <laughs> And he had these little jokes, and uh, uh, last year we went to Los Angeles together, and I was supposed to talk to this large congregational church, and there were hundreds of people, and the pastor introduced my friend Bill first, and he's not shy, so he walks right up, he says, uh, hi everybody, he says, uh, I have a question for you all, how do you make holy water? <laughs> I imagine there was not one Catholic around there, and... It was absolute silence. You said, well, you boil the hell out of it, you said. <laughs> so, it's a different kind of uh, lecturing than when I was at uh, Yale or at Harvard. <laughs> but as I, as I live in this community, um, something has happened to me, I want just to say a few words about. And that is that, okay, I found a home. I found a home. And I, I, I really hope I can, can live out my life in that home. So it's an incredible gift to have a home that is created for you by people who are very weak, very broken. But the interesting thing is that now I start also realizing that uh, I'm coming in touch with a new homelessness, with a second loneliness, you could call it that way. Uh, and maybe it is precisely the fact that you have found a home and feel deeply loved that you somewhere realize that on a deeper place, there is still a whole, whole journey to go, and there is a new loneliness that you discover precisely when you have found a home. And lately, I've been thinking a lot about the many losses in my life, but also in our communities. So I'm now 62, my friends, some of them are dying. Uh, in our community, people are dying. Uh, I have a lot of people around me who are no longer able to do what they could do quite well a few years ago. But I also discover that I come into that phase of my life uh, where I experience many losses. And many of my friends do too. And these losses are very painful very, very real. And suddenly he realizes that there will be more losses instead of less in the coming years. Losses of friends, losses of family, but also losses of your own vitality, and your own health, and your own energy. And, and I've been wondering about that. And the question that I am trying to live in this community now is how to how to live these losses, how to live these losses in a way that they can become fruitful. And that question wasn't really with me 10 years ago, but today it's very much how, how can I make my life and help to make other people's life fruitful. And I realized that when I read the Gospels that Jesus never invited me to make my life successful or productive, but I'm invited to make my life fruitful. And, and, and I, I, I started realizing that the fruitfulness comes out of vulnerability, comes out of brokenness, comes out of weakness. Success comes out of strength. I do this, I do this, I do that, and here it is, and I do it again, and there it is again, and do it again, it's again. 
And people say, you're quite productive. Uh, and Julian was trying to uh, suggest that I was quite productive. But, but uh, I'm called to be fruitful. And that's something else. And fruits grow out of brokenness, out of weakness. The, the grain of wheat has to die. And when it dies, it will bear many fruits. Those who lose their life will gain it. And suddenly, suddenly I started to realize that, that finally, uh, finally, we are people who, who are going to lose our lives. And how can that loss be a fruitful loss? And for, for a long time, uh, my question had been, how can I help myself and other people you know, to do significant things in the years left to live. But for me, the question much more now is how to prepare myself and to help others to prepare themselves so that they can die in a way that's fruitful. So that we can die and make our life a gift. And I've been writing a little bit about that. But, but how, how can our lives be fruitful and the fruit of our life may quite well be beyond our chronology, beyond our years. And um, I, I, I wonder, when I but think about my own spiritual tradition, you know, my Christian tradition, and I know not everybody here lives in that tradition, but, but for me it's the place where I always go to to discover the meaning of my life. And I listen to Jesus. He says, it's good for you that I die, because when I die, I will send you my spirit. And I suddenly realize this, when I die, will I send a spirit? Will I send the spirit of God? Will I, will I have anything to send? And suddenly I, it, it became very important for me to realize that, uh, that uh, we are finally called to to let go in such a way that our life can be fruitful for generations to come. And that ministry and care maybe finally is not to help people live successful or even productive lives, but finally to help people discover that even through their deaths they will be more fruitful than ever. That finally, the gift of life that is given has to be given again. And if it's given again, it will bear fruit. So I, 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 I think that's something I, I feel more and more when I think about ministry and care. I think about it as, as how to help people claim their fruitfulness, that is, and a fruitfulness that, that manifests itself in our vulnerability, in our brokenness, in our weakness, in our, in our feeling of powerlessness. Finally, we, we become completely powerless. It can be believed that as we become more and more powerless, that the power of the Spirit can, can be sent by us and beyond our own life. So when Julian was introducing me, he was talking about my little interest in the trapeze, and maybe this is, I should stop by telling you a little story about that. Because I, I, I love these trapeze artists a lot, and, and it's been something really, really remarkable. You know, when my father, who is 88 years old, and I went to the circus for the first time and saw these these trapeze artists, and I said, oh, that's what I always had wanted to be. <laughs> that's it, that's it. You know, I couldn't care less for the elephants and for the tigers and for the clowns and all that's quite boring to me, but, but 
but I saw these five people dancing in the, in the air and, and in this big circus cupola. I said, that's it, that's it, that's it. So in the, in the break, I said, hey, guys, you're great. <laughs> you're great. I was just like this little person who finally had become a, f a real fan. And I was just admiring them immensely. And they said, oh, well, why don't you come to our practice session tomorrow morning? I said, oh, you, really? <laughs> and then they said, well, you have dinner with us in our caravan, and why don't you travel with us? And so we became friends, and I spent a lot of time there. And there are three flyers and two catchers. <laughs> three flyers who make these incredible triples, you know? And then being... Gotta be careful here. <laughs> and I, I... I was talking to Rodley, because they're called the Flying Rodleys. And I was talking to him and he says, Henry, he says, you know, everybody's always applauding me because I make these spectacular triples. But the real, the real hero is the one who is not so much applauded, that's the catcher. <laughs> and the catcher is on a, on a catch by that moves. And then meanwhile, the, the, the flyer comes from the pedestal and goes and to make all these triples. And Rodley says, Henry, the greatest temptation for me as a flyer is to try to catch the catcher. Because the catcher will be there. I have to trust that. And when I come down for my triple, I have to stretch out my hands. And whether I'm here or whether I'm there or whether I'm here, I have to trust that he will be there. And he will pull me right up into the couple. That's what I have to trust. And if I start... And we break our wrists and then we are in trouble. And I, I suddenly realized what life is all about. We are invited to make a lot of triples and jumps. But the great thing is to, to trust the catcher and to know that we will be caught when we come down from our triples and our doubles and our special tricks. And you know, and, and, and somewhere, I, I keep asking myself, uh, do I trust the catcher? And do I dare to say, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Do I dare to, to let go and to say, that will happen, even when I, when I am still a little scared at times. And so I, I just want to thank you, uh, to thank you for, for uh, inviting me here, for letting me share a little bit about what's happening in my life, and, and to say that, uh, just to, to tell you that, that I, I enjoy flying. <laughs> I enjoy taking risks, doing all sort of things, but somewhere underneath all of that, there is this, there is this trust that uh, there is a catcher. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you invited me here and uh, that we could sort of be together a little bit and, and, and pray for me and let's pray for one another that, uh, that, we, that what we do in the coming years will, be really, will really be full of, of courage and full of confidence and full of trust. Thank you so much. Just take that on back to the table.